Our next guest is none other than Princeton University physics professor, William Happer, who is out here on a speaking tour in Australia with the IPA, the Institute of Public Affairs, speaking about climate science integrity. And he's doing what he can to calm down the climate catastrophists. Not only that, he's got a bit of a special pedigree. He also served a year in former President Donald Trump's administration as senior director of the National Security Council, and he joins us now. Professor Happer, a great pleasure to have you here on set with us today in Australia. Tell us, what is it that the climate catastrophists are getting wrong about CO2? <laughs> Well, the first thing they're getting wrong is the sign. In, in physics, we like to joke that in theories of physics, getting the sign right is the hardest thing, whether it's good or bad. And they've gotten the sign wrong for CO2. More CO2 is good for the world. It's not bad for the world. And so it's absurd to be trying to reduce CO2 with all the other problems, you know, with the absurd projections of uh, lower costs for renewable energy. That's, that's clearly a lie. It's not true. And explain to us how is, in your opinion, as a Princeton professor and climate scientist and physicist, how is CO2 good for the world? Well, for the first thing, if you look at geological history, and uh, you've got lots of good geologists here in Australia who've made this point many times, we're in a CO2 famine now compared to what is normal for plants. And just about any plant, if you give it more CO2 and a lot more, it will do better. In my country, uh, most greenhouses double or triple the amount of CO2 and they have to pay for it. It's not cheap, but it's worth investing in it because the plants grow so much better. The quality of the flowers and the fruits are so much better. And uh, the situation is even better outside of greenhouses because in addition to the benefits you get in a greenhouse where you have plenty of water, you get resistance to drought. And that's particularly important in Australia, which has large areas that are quite arid. Mm. And if you look from satellites, Australia is a poster boy of greening of the entire world, especially Western Australia. So it's unbelievable that they've managed to... Uh, turn this beneficial gas, a part of life, into a threat. You know, they talk about carbon pollution. I, I can't imagine what they're talking about. We're made of carbon. <laughs> right, right? <laughs> and we breathe out two pounds of CO a day, each of us, mm -hmm. right? Eight billion people, you know, two pounds a day. Mm. Multiply that by the number of days in the year. Uh, and in fact, you know, many of them say, well, people are the real problem. It's not the CO2. We've got too many people and uh, really, we can't have more than a billion people in the world. So I, I look around in a room, they're not even the seven out of eight of us here on this show enough to uh, reduce the population. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, sinister so stuff, uh, Liz. Yeah. yeah, it's a very anti-human agenda, isn't yeah. it? As you were just saying, we need CO2. It helps our plants thrive. Right. Therefore, it helps us thrive. Right. Um, here in Australia, we have an organization called the Bureau of Meteorology, and yeah. that gives a lot of people the stats that they turn to to prove climate change, etc. Right. And we've had... Uh, many esteemed people, Morris Newman and others, call them out on inaccurate reporting or right. at least skewing the numbers right. so it appears to go along with the climate change right. narrative. Do you have similar in uh, America, these kinds of organisations who are measuring and they're across all the stats and they've got all the fancy equipment and despite what you believe to be true, they are pushing this agenda doggedly? Yes, we have the same problem, and they have the same problem in Europe. You know, these, and you know, I've been a bureaucrat myself, so I understand how it works. You're, you're, <laughs> you're worried about next sides. year's budget, and you know, whoever's in control has an agenda. Sure. And so you have to make this trade off between the truth and, and satisfying your paymaster. And I'm sure that's going on in Australia. It certainly goes on in the United States, because I. I 
seen it personally. Wow. Dean McPherson. Professor Aperol, I want to pick you up on something you said just a moment ago. I think you said we're in a CO2 famine. Now, the way I understand things is the problem is the Industrial Revolution. We've been pumping all this CO2 into the atmosphere. The way I've understood it, there's never been more CO2 in the atmosphere. That's the problem. But are you implying that there was more CO2 in the atmosphere prior to Industrial Revolution times? Oh, yes, since the Cambrian uh, explosion of life that we can measure with good fossils, that was maybe 500 billion years ago, uh, CO2 levels have gone way down. You know, they've typically been three, four, five times what they are now, and plants are adapted to much higher levels. And so they're harmed in a number of ways by the low levels now. They're particularly sensitive to drought, for example. They didn't used to be so sensitive to drought. And uh, there's a more subtle problem. They have a, uh, it turns out that the, the enzyme they use is poisoned by oxygen if there's not enough CO2. So plants have to devote a lot of their resources to detoxifying this oxygen poisoning. If you double CO2, they don't have to work as hard to protect themselves from oxygen. That's the main reason greenhouses work better is that you get rid of the oxygen poisoning. The photorespiration is the technical term. Uh, Professor Happer, one of the things that always strikes me about these debates, and I'm not a scientist myself, but it does always strike me that there's a real reductionist uh, sort of quality to these debates. People say, oh, well, you know, we've got some terrible weather on hand. That's because of the CO2. And therefore, it is Australia's responsibility to decarbonize and deindustrialize and all of this. And yet there's a great ignorance about other sort of natural phenomena that occur. And I remember at a year and a half, two years ago, there was a massive explosion with a uh, volcano in Tonga, which, um, which apparently trapped an awful lot of water vapor in the air, led to an El Nino period lasting much longer in Australia mm-hmm. than it was supposed to, to have. Um, what, where does this illusion of control come from that the people who are so maniacally focused on our human industrial CO2 emissions come from? Well, you know, that's you're, you're asking about what motivates people, and I'm really good with instruments and differential <laughs> equations, but I've been studying people all my life. I really don't understand them. But, you know, if you look back over history, this happens again and again. For example, in our country, we had the Salem witch trials. Mm-hmm. In those days, uh, the witches were accused of ruining the weather, and, among other and things. And ruining the crops. And, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so what's the right solution? You put them all to death, you hang them all. And we had these uh, odious trials in uh, Massachusetts. The judges, all, most of the judges had degrees from Harvard University, and it was pushed, actually, by the academics. It wasn't pushed by the common people. Gee, what does that sound yeah. familiar at all? <laughs> Liz. Very reminiscent. Yeah, yeah. Just quickly, what are your thoughts, because I'm hearing more and more about this, on things that can be done to adjust the weather, control the weather, things like cloud seeding, that yeah. kind of thing. Are you a believe, believer in that? Do you think, it's, do you think that's going on Some sort of control of the, the atmosphere? Well, we, we have tried in our country, maybe Australia too, uh, again and again to control the weather with cloud seeding. There was a big push in the 1950s where we had airplanes flying around releasing iodine, uh, silver iodide, for example, as nuclei. Um, the atmosphere is just so big that I don't think it's very practical. It'll be a long time before it's practical. Now, that may be happening naturally. One of the theories for why climate changes, and it changes all the time, it's not, this sure. is nothing new, is that uh, the sun itself is indirectly seeding cloud formation or not seeding mm. cloud formation. And when you have a lot of low clouds, uh, it's common knowledge that it's cooler. And clouds are often formed by cosmic rays. And so one of the theories of these long-term changes is that the cosmic ray background changes, and that changes the cloud cover. Right. So, so anyway, I, th- I think this whole field has been set back 50 years by the uh, maniacal focus on CO2. I mm. mean, it is important, after all. You know, climate, sure. We all are subject to climate. It'd be well, nice it, if we really understood it instead of we have these witch trials, right? Yes. Indeed. Yes. Professor William Happer, thank you so much for joining us. And, of course, our Melbourne viewers will know that the climate changes every 15 minutes. <laughs>